Well, good morning, good morning. How are we all doing this morning? Good, good. Well, my name is Ryan Clement. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and it is always a joy and an honor to share with you, to speak before you, to open up God's word, and to really share with you what God has put on my heart for us for this morning. Um, my family just got back from a week-long trip in Carmel uh, last weekend, and so it was wonderful to get up there and to have just a good time together. We recently moved to a uh, home in Lakewood, and so our Thanksgiving break, our Christmas break, all of that was not a break. It was packing and unpacking and moving and doing all the stuff. And so we finally got to go to Carmel. This is just a little picture of the China Cove hike at, at Point Lobos up there. Who's, who's ever been to Point Lobos? Anybody? Anybody? A few of us? No, none of us? One of us? Okay. If you ever get up that area, it is beautiful. It is gorgeous. We went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and all sorts of stuff. It was fun to just have quality family time. And it was just a good reminder of why we just need time away, why we just need a break from the regular everyday life things to just rest, enjoy quality time as a family, and it's a good opportunity to reset, come back into everyday life with a fresh perspective. And so it was really good for us, and it was a really good opportunity. And so I just wanted to share that. Uh, we are... We wrapped up our series this last Sunday uh, titled, I Once Was Lost, where we've been spending kind of these last five weeks looking at specific stages or thresholds that people go through on their way to faith in Jesus. And so we've looked at those thresholds as how we can help other people in their journey towards faith in Jesus. And we've also looked at those for some of us who are on that journey of seeking kind of where we're at and, and how we're doing. And so uh, Pastor Ryan Bogert wrapped us up on that last week. And I just wanted to share with you a few reflections I've had during this series, and then we're going to really spend the majority of the sermon jumping into um, Palm Sunday and what that meant and what Jesus' triumphal entry was and, and what he did and what he said, and so I'm looking forward to that. So before we jump in, let me just give a, a moment of prayer for us to just intentionally invite God to speak to us through this word this morning. God, we just come here to worship you, to praise you, and to say that we need you. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from your word. God, open up our minds and our hearts, Lord, and all of us to hear what it is you have for us. Help us to receive from you, Lord, to be convicted of sin, to be um, restored this morning, and to be healed and redeemed. God, do whatever it is you know that we need this morning. We love you. We praise you. And all God's people said... Amen. So if you've missed part of this series, I highly encourage you to check it out on our website, our YouTube, our app. We have all of our sermons. You can always go back and kind of watch. I know it's been really helpful for me to really process how I can be more intentional to help people on their journey to faith in Jesus. Before this series, I kind of just had one category, like they're all seeking or not seeking. And this really helped to break down the stages that people kind of go through. And so that was really, really helpful. Uh, but a few things that I was able to reflect on. The first is... The title of the series, I Once Was Lost, and all we talked about, reminded me that I, too, once was lost. It caused me to reflect on my season of life before I committed my life to Jesus and how lost I really was. The funny thing is, before coming to know Jesus, I probably wouldn't characterize my life as lost. But once I was found by God, it made sense that I was lost before. Living for myself, living without purpose, not sure what the point of this life was, not sure where I was called to go or what I was called to do, but God's given me purpose. The gospel has given me salvation. And I was reminded that I too once was lost. And for me, that's probably one of the greatest motivators to share our faith with other people. Oftentimes we tend to use tactics like guilt or shame or you're supposed to be sharing your faith or if you're a good Christian, you're supposed to do this. But for me, that's never really motivated me. But what motivates me the most out of this series is remembering how lost I once was, how far I've come, and how much God has done a powerful work in my life. And that has reinvigorated my passion to want to share the good news with other people that need that. So I've been encouraged by that during this series. I've also been reminded of the power of prayer. So much of our series has focused on how to practically walk with people through faith development stages. But I was reminded that ultimately, Coming to faith in Jesus is up to God. He is the one that does the work in our lives, and we need to be in prayer for that process. We need to be in prayer that God would be at work in people's lives. I was also reminded that not everybody's ready. I felt tempted to try to figure out what stage everybody was in, but the reality is there are many people in my life that I know that don't want a part of any of these stages of faith development, and they're just not ready for it, or they're not there. 
And that's okay. That's where they're at. I was also reminded that we need to meet people where they are actually at, not where we want them to be or not where we think they are. And one of my tendencies in wanting to share faith with others is to, to try to assume that people are at a certain spot or to, to hopefully wish they were there, but they're not really there. And we try to reach out to them where we think they should be or where we think they are at rather than listening to what they really need and what they're really experiencing. The last thing I was reminded of is that while relational evangelism is a high priority, we want to be able to share faith with people over time in relationship. God can use moments. God can use someone that you've just met for a moment to get to pray with them or care with them. I've had countless times where I've met somebody briefly, and I just, you know what, can I just pray for you? And they've said yes, and through that prayer time, I know God did some work in their thresholds, so to speak. And so it can be in a moment, it can be with a stranger, and I just wanted to encourage us with that. So hopefully this series has been helpful for you, hopefully you have found it to be a blessing, and I want to jump into Palm Sunday this morning. Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter every year. It's always one week before, and it's the day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into the capital holy city of Jerusalem. He comes in riding on a colt, and he's celebrated like a king, and this big triumphant week ends only five days later in the death and crucifixion of Jesus. This triumphant entry takes a dramatic turn of events to Jesus' crucifixion and then another turn to Jesus' resurrection, which we celebrate on Easter Sunday two days later. So I want to talk with us this morning a little bit about what Palm Sunday was like and what it meant. And more specifically, Jesus' first act in Jerusalem after his triumphant entry. He goes to the temple and he does some pretty big and profound things. And that's what we're focusing on this morning. So I'm going to read for us out of John chapter 12. We're going to be in verse 12. You're welcome to follow along on your own devices or or paper Bibles, that sort. Uh, We're also going to have it on the screens if you want to walk through. So John, the gospel of John is written by the apostle John. And it's one of the four gospels in the New Testament and the account of what Jesus said and what he did. So John chapter 12 verse 12 says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And this is a quote from Zechariah 9.9, which is found in the Old Testament. And that scripture says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here's what's taking place. Jesus has spent months and even years wandering around Galilee in various parts of the, the surrounding area. He's been preaching the good news. He's been healing the sick. He's been casting out demons. He's been providing food miraculously. He's been teaching all sorts of things. He's been having some tough conversations with the Pharisees. He's been hanging out at weddings, doing everyday life, teaching his disciples, and doing all sorts of things. Along the way, we often see Jesus telling someone who has been healed, shh, don't tell anyone. Because he didn't want the word to get out. He didn't want the publicity to be so big. But by this point in his ministry, he's got masses of crowds. In Luke's account, he just resurrected Lazarus from the dead just before this. And so we see that now there is, number one, a giant crowd of people following Jesus because he's doing some amazing things. Number two, it is that time of year where they are celebrating the week-long feast of Passover. Passover is probably the greatest holiday, one of the most important holidays in Jewish tradition. It is the holiday that celebrates the exiting out of Egypt in order for the Israelites to come out of Egypt uh, in freedom. There were 10 plagues of judgment on the Egyptians. The final Uh, Plague of Judgment was the angel of death taking the life of the firstborn of every family. And if you had the blood of the lamb over your door, your family was passed over. And so that is still celebrated even to this day. 
And so this is a great big feast, which means anyone and everyone who considers themselves a follower of God, of Yahweh, they would come to Jerusalem, they would come to the temple this time of year. So you've got the masses of crowds following Jesus because of all the great stuff he said. And then you've got the masses of people from all around the region all coming into Jerusalem for the Passover feast for that week. Many people, this was like their yearly pilgrimage. So you have this massive convergence of all sort of people all coming into Jerusalem at once. And what happens is really cool. So from the time of King David and all of the kings after him, whenever a king was going to be made king, they had this special, powerful procession into Jerusalem. So this triumphal entry of Jesus is actually a tradition that was practiced for many, many hundreds of years. Whenever someone was going to be made king, they proceeded into the city of Jerusalem. They had a whole procession of people in front of them and behind them on animals and all this kind of stuff. I was thinking about Aladdin. I was watching the, the Will Smith Aladdin on Disney Plus, you know, and if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. But Aladdin's got this like massive processional. And so I've kind of imagined that probably on a little bit like lower scale. Um, but kings would come in and celebrate. And so what was really cool is that Israel is under Roman rule. The Pharisees in many ways are in control of things. There's a lot of hostility around what Jesus is doing. And there's an organic orchestration of this massive uh, processional. Like Jesus' disciples weren't going out passing out party flyers. Like, hey, we got this like palm thing going on. If you want to come out like next week, uh, it's going to be sweet. There was nothing. It was an organic engagement of the people to come together and what their fathers and their mothers and their grandparents and their great-grandparents had done for hundreds of years to celebrate the entrance of a new king. They did that for Jesus. But he was riding on a lowly colt. It was a much more humble entrance. But they brought out the palms, which signified praise, which signified the coming of a king. They laid their cloaks out on dirt roads to make a nice, clean path for Jesus to come in. And so it is this powerful, organic entry, this grand entrance that comes in. And so what happens is, after this powerful entrance, Jesus goes to, according to three of the Gospels, he goes right to the temple. Now, the temple is this place, it's really the center of social life, okay? In our present day, we've got, like, churches, we've got, like, the Portuguese hall, we've got, like, the community center, we've got, like, downtown. There's all these sorts of gathering places. But in Jerusalem, the temple was, like, the one and only big social space. It was the only place that had enough space to have gatherings of large crowds and large groups. Now, in the temple property, the smallest building kind of in the center on the edge is the Holy of Holies. That's where, like, the, the most important sacrifices were made. Only, like, the special priests were able to go there. Then outside was the, the little courtyard where they performed the sacrifices, uh, casual, regular sacrifices where only men, Israelite men, were able to go. Then there was another courtyard where the women were allowed to be in. Then there was another outer courtyard where Gentiles, non-Jewish people, were allowed to be. And then outside of that was kind of the rest of the city. And so Jesus triumphantly enters into Jerusalem and goes straight to the temple. Now we know from scripture that Jesus spends the rest of his week teaching in the temple. And so I would assume that Jesus is going to teach in the temple. But when he shows up, he finds a problem. He finds some issues. And this is what Jesus does as he enters the temple. We're in Matthew 21 now, uh, verse 12. I want to look at Matthew's account of what Jesus does and says as he goes into the temple on his processional. It says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So here's what's going on. This quote-unquote newly installed king, which Jesus was not technically installed as a king, but the people celebrated him like one, disrupts the economy. One of the most primary important pieces of the economy goes to the temple during the most important festival and holiday of the year where so much business is taking place because 
There's only one temple in existence. There's only one place you can sacrifice for your sins, which means if this is your family's yearly trip to the temple, you better have that money saved up to buy those animals to pay all the sacrifices for all the sins you and your family and your loved ones and everyone you're representing has committed. So this is big business time. And Jesus shows up to the temple and realizes that this house of prayer and worship has become a den of robbers. That it is now used for business. It is now used for corruption. And instead of all these people coming together to genuinely worship God and pray and hear from the teaching, it has become a business center. And it's become a place where, well, it's kind of a monopoly. So some scholars would say there was likely corruption going on. Prices were getting hiked up, right? Oh, you need that kind of animal. We've got limited supply here, but you really need this sacrifice. And what they basically produced was the system where you paid for forgiveness. Martin Luther in the Reformation in the 1500s criticizes the Catholic Church for this very same thing, the paying of indulgences. For the right price, you can get forgiveness of any sin. And so Jesus is frustrated by this system. He drives out, he turns over the money changers because there's going to be currency from all over the region. He drives out the business and he makes space in the temple once again for worship, for prayer, and for hearing God's teachings. Now there's all sorts of debates on what this passage means and what it is that Jesus was saying. And let me be clear I don't think that while the temple had become a farmer's market of sorts, and I do love farmer's markets, by the way. I mean, you got the food, you got the the stuff, you get the goodies. I love farmer's markets. The temple had become a farmer's market of sorts, but Jesus is not judging the selling of things in the temple necessarily. Like, I don't think if Jesus showed up today, he would see that we're selling donuts after for the students, and then he would turn the donut table over and just say, like, you've ruined all of these things. I think what's happened here is that they made a business. They turned worship into a, a, they monetized worship. And they made this disruptive kind of process where it wasn't about praising God. It wasn't about forgiveness of sins. It was about making money. And there, it was so crowded with the business, there was no room for the daily prayer. There was daily prayer at the temple in this time. There was not much room for teaching. There was not much room for worship. And the space for the Gentiles to come and worship and the women and the men to come and worship was just overcrowded. And Jesus makes space. Now, two things Jesus says. The first he says is, my house will be called a house of prayer. Now, Jesus is quoting here from Isaiah 56, and we're going to read that passage. It's seven verses long, but I think it's really important to hear what Jesus is quoting from and how his simple quote of a few words is referencing, I believe, this entire passage as Jesus casts judgment both physically and verbally on the situation at the temple. Isaiah 56 verse 1 says, and by the way, Isaiah is a prophet of the Lord and he is speaking as God's mouthpiece that these are the words from God. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right for my salvation is close at hand. And my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this. The person who holds fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps their hands from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations." Now, there is so much to unpack here, but for the sake of time, let us understand this. Number one, God is promoting justice and doing what is right. He is telling his people to do what is right. Number two, to the eunuchs, those who will not have any family, any offspring, he says, 
as long as you are faithful to me, I will make space for you to be in my family. To the foreigners, God says, you have room in my temple. You have room in my family as long as you are faithful to me. And I love that this passage is about the inclusion of all people in the world, culminating in the phrase, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. So many religious practices are so exclusionary. You have to meet specific criteria and do certain things in order to get the blessings. Yet our God says all are welcome, all are invited, and my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And so Jesus, by quoting this, is judging that in a time and season at the temple where literally all nations in the surrounding regions have come together to the temple, they have turned worship into monetary gain and corruption, and they have thus excluded all nations from prayer and made it all about business. And Jesus is reminding of the people with his phrase of judgment that God wants all people and all nations in his family. That for all who would be faithful to him, there is room for you. And the temple is to be a place of refuge and safety and prayer and worship and hearing God's word. The second piece of Jesus' judgment phrase, he says that you have made the temple into a den of robbers. Very simply, a den of robbers is the place where robbers go to retreat, to hide, to hide their spoils, to hide in safety. They commit the robbery over here out on the road, and then they hide in their secret den or their lair of where they can regroup, be safe. And so Jesus calls those working in the temple a, that they have made the temple of den of robbers. And he's quoting from Jeremiah 7, a little bit shorter passage, starting in verse 9. Will you steal and murder? Commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known. And then come and stand before me in my house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things. Has the house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. And here the prophet Jeremiah is criticizing God's people for basically living a sinful life. And then showing up to the temple and worship going like, oh, all is good. Here's my sacrifice. Here's my temple time. I'm good. And basically living a double life. Living separated. Living out in sin in everyday life. And then coming to the temple as if everything is good. A modern day equivalent might be showing up to church, looking nice, acting nice, feeling good. But really our lives are full of sin and corruption. And Jeremiah is calling that out and calling that to attention. And that is exactly what Jesus is quoting when he's speaking to the temple and saying, you have made this house into a den of robbers, a place where you hide out and you think you're safe, but you're living a life of sin and corruption. So what does this mean for us in our present day? What does this mean for us here and now? A few comparisons I want us to think through. The first is the church as temple. What I mean by that is in this day, in Jesus' day, there was one temple and you came to to worship. Now, in our present day, there's a church on every street corner. There's all sorts of churches. We would say that the church is really the people, not the building. But just for the sake of what we are doing today as church, let's compare that. What is it that we are doing as a church that if Jesus were to show up today, he would want to call us a den of robbers? Or would want to say, you have turned my house of prayer into a den of robbers. And I want us to have this posture to really be humble and to reflect. My goal in this sermon is not to come with a heavy hand of judgment and condemnation and say, we have been a horrible church, we need to repent. No, I think we're doing a lot of great things. But I think if we are faithful to the word, we have to say, God, where have we been missing it? Where have we been consumed with the business of going to church, of doing church, and where have we missed you? Have we turned church into an exchange? I'm going to show up. I'm going to give my money. I'm going to give my time. I'm going to give my attention. And I'm going to be blessed in return. And my week is going to be blessed. And God is going to give me favor. Have we turned this too into a commodity, into a monetary exchange of sorts? Are we following in the business of church? Are we too busy with church stuff? And have we lost sight of that personal connection and intimacy and relationship with God? I think we need to ask these questions of ourselves this morning, this week, always, and forever. I've been reflecting on myself. Where have I just been too busy that I can't really have time for prayer and for scripture and for fellowship? What in, in 
how I'm doing life do I need to drive out? And that's the second part of this, which is the body as temple, okay? The Apostle Paul talks about in the New Testament and some of his epistles, the idea that since the Spirit of God no longer just dwells in the temple, but dwells in every person that acknowledges Jesus as Savior, our bodies have become a temple. So if our bodies have become a temple, then how are we being good stewards and honoring the God who lives inside of us? So then personally, where have we allowed sin or corruption to come in and to take root in our lives and in our hearts, to take up the precious space that God needs? Where have we given our lives to sin? And so I want us this morning to reflect and think on that. You know, I read this passage out of Jeremiah 7 where Jeremiah criticizes the sins of the Israelites, and he sort of gives this list. And I want to go through that list, and I just want us to think, do we relate to any of these? Do we find any of these to be true this morning? Jeremiah 7, 9 says, Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? So, the first part is stealing. Where in our lives do we take what is not ours? Do we take what we have not worked for or what we have not earned? Where are we taking what does not belong to us? Maybe that's physically. Maybe that's socially. Maybe that's emotionally. Where are we invested somewhere just to get from someone else? What about murder? Yes, this means the physical taking of someone's life. But in a, in a lighter sense, where are we life taking? Where are we life draining to other people? Where do we do things just for our own benefit at the expense of others? And what about sexual activity? Ironically, the, the statistics and the surveys show that sexual activity amongst Christians and non-Christians is roughly the same. We treat sexuality very similarly. And the Bible is really clear that sexual activity is meant for marriage. But what sexual activity do we engage with outside of that? What about perjury? Telling lies, falling back on our words, not following through on our commitments, deceiving others, being dishonest. And the last is trusting in other gods, other spiritual practices, other worldly mentalities in life rather than depending on God and his word. You see, Jesus came in in this triumphal, triumphant procession and was celebrated like a king, but went straight to the temple with judgment and brought to light the sin and corruption that was taking place. And so I feel like it is faithful to the scripture to ask us to reflect and pray, where are we missing God? Now, I want to be super clear that everyone is always welcome here. I don't ever want anyone to feel like, and I don't think any of our staff or pastors want anyone to feel like this is an exclusive church, that you have to have it all together to be here. No, everyone is always welcome. I think God welcomes us exactly how we are. But if we've been around for a while and we've got some sin in our life that we still need to deal with, today is a, is a call. It's a call to address that and to work towards that. And sin is both repented of in a moment, but also worked on over long seasons. It takes time to work on. And so the invitation is to step into those things. So Jesus calls attention to sin and judgment. And then I love this. The verse immediately following the tossing of tables and the casting out of all the money changers and the business people is verse 14. And it says this. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. You see, Jesus takes out the corruption of the temple in order to make space for God's healing and redeeming work. And that is exactly what God wants to do with the sin in our life. He wants us to get rid of that sin so he can restore us, so he can make us whole, so he can make us new, so he can heal us. So in place of that corruption, he can bring new life. And unfortunately, we have this mentality that God is up there wanting to judge us, wanting to call out our sin, wanting to catch us in the act, so to speak, just to bust us. Sometimes I feel like my own kids have that mentality, right, where they're, they're afraid of getting in trouble. And we have this mindset that God just wants to bust us, but a loving God wants to call out sin to help heal and protect his beloved children. 
As a parent with a six-year-old and two four-year-olds, when I see, I had a conversation with one of my kids just yesterday about something they were doing and that they needed to change and they were denying it and I didn't do this and it's not my fault. And I tried to help them see why it was their fault and what they did wrong and what was hurtful. And it was this emotionally heated, upset conversation and I tried my best to get across. I don't just wanna get you in trouble. I wanna help you heal. I want to help you live rightly. I want you to be a life-giving person to yourself and to others. And if I don't fix the problems now, then you're going to be a destructive force in this world. You see, God wants to call out our sin, not to bust us, not for guilt or shame that lasts more than a moment, but for redemption and for restoration. Because God says, I have something so much better for you. I've created this world to be a blessing. And by choosing sin, you're accepting the corruption. You're accepting this pain. You're afflicting on yourself. And I know what it's like to be stuck in sin. I know what it's like to feel like I just can't get out of this. I've tried to make a change. But this morning is a renewal and a refreshing to revisit that and to say, God, help me. Because I can't get past this on my own. Only by your miraculous work can I get past this. So we finish this sermon this morning celebrating God's desire for restoration and for renewal, that he wants to make us new, that he's got a great plan for our life. He wants to cleanse us of unrighteousness and purify us so that we can be made whole and be made fresh. So we're kicking off Holy Week this week by bringing focus on the very reason that Jesus needed to die on the cross, our sins. And I want to encourage us this week to dive in a little bit more than we might normally dive in to our Holy Week activities, to press into what God has for us. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to hear from you. And I pray that you would just do, again, whatever it is you need to do in each of our lives. We are all unique. We are all going through a different story, a different set of experiences. And I just pray, God, that you would do whatever it is you need to do. Help us to come to terms with some of our sin, to accept it, to be willing to confess it, to share with you. And not just stop there, but invite in your restoration. Invite in your presence. Invite in your healing and to walk with you. I pray that no person walks away from here discouraged all week. But I pray that we would leave today hopeful, knowing that you are doing a great redemptive work in our lives, God. We just say that we love you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory with our words and with our lives. And all God's people said,